welcome to another weekend worship service here at Friends Church. My name is Todd Frazier, the online host, and we're really excited that you're joining us. Before we get to service, there's a few things we'd like to bring to your attention. First, on Wednesday mornings, we're starting a live This Week at Friends where Jen and I sit down and we talk through the things that are going on during the week. Make sure to join us live this Wednesday morning for that. Next, we have daily devotionals that are coming out with Matthew and Chris and other pastors throughout the week. So make sure to tune into those on all of our social media platforms. In addition, we also have the Friends Church podcast where every week we upload the message by itself and additional interviews and devotionals throughout the week. For those of you that have been asking about the Easter worship, we just released on Friday the song More, written by our very own Matt Roden on Friends Worship, available on iTunes and Spotify and anywhere you get your music. So make sure to go download that and share it with your friends and family today. Remember, if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, we have a live engagement team standing by to interact with you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or if you'd just like to let us know where you're watching from, we'd love to hear from you. Lastly, if there's anything you need, if you need help, or if you'd just like to connect with us, Make sure to go to friends.church and at the bottom, click on the little chat bubble. We would love to hear from you and help you in any way that we can. With that, let's turn it over to David and the worship team as service begins. We're really glad that you're with us. Hello, friends. So glad to be with you today. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to raise up a hallelujah wherever you are. Come on, sing this together. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Come on, we're gonna lift it up. Say, I raise a hallelujah. Our weapon, my weapon is a melody. of your heart we say I raise a hallelujah we declare I will watch the darkness flee oh I raise a hallelujah in the middle of a mystery I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the 
Everybody. Thank you for joining us this week in Friends Church. We are so excited that you are a part of our service today as we speak about unshakable hope. And in a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about God and who he is in our lives right now in the midst of sometimes temptation and sometimes defeat. But we believe our God is victorious and we can't wait to talk about that today. But we're so glad you are joining us. And I just want to give you a, a few things to keep in your mind as this week comes together for us at Friends. Next weekend 
is Mother's Day. Hard to believe it is already here. And we're gonna celebrate you moms together. We got some special things ready for you. And uh, we also have a great guest coming that I'm gonna interview, Pam Tebow. Uh, mom of Tim Tebow, the football player that we've had at our church, is going to be here, and I'm going to be interviewing her, and you're going to get to hear about her and her family and her faith. And I want you to join us next weekend, invite somebody with you to be a part of our service as we celebrate moms together. And then the second thing that's going to happen coming up this week, May 4th through the 8th, it's called Seek Week. And one of the great things is a bunch of us pastors got together and there are about a hundred churches that are gonna be praying and worshiping all together virtually throughout the week. There's gonna be information at friends.church and it's gonna be on all our social media platforms. We'll tell you more about it. But Monday night is specifically our Orange County night. On May 4th, we're gonna to gather together virtually with all the other churches in North Orange County. And every evening, there's going to be a different emphasis and a different prayer time, different people leading worship. And so as a church, we are participating and we want to invite you as we call on God, as we ask for him to heal our land and for us to turn to him and seek him in all that's going on right now in our country and in our world. It kind of culminates on the National Day of Prayer. And so we believe Seek Week is gonna be really important in the life of our church, but also in the life of our community. So join us May 4th through 8th. You can go to friends.church and find out more information. And then the last thing I just wanna to say to you is just a huge thank you. Uh, for those of you who are part of the Friends family, for those of you who are part of our extended family around the corner and around the world, thank you for participating with us each and every weekend. But also thank you for giving. You are making a huge difference in the life of the church, but in the life of our community. And we received a, a bunch of letters, but one that just stood out to me was a, a senior home uh, called Addie's Cottage. And Addie's Cottage was having some trouble getting some, uh, some things that they needed, personal hand sanitizers and masks uh, back in the beginning of March. And within 24 hours, they wrote and they said, um, Friends Church responded with all kinds of protective equipment. And we sent over all the things that we could and all the things we have to assist them and to help them out. And then she writes, the best part is this, because of your kindness, because of your gifts, two of my co coworkers accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because I invited them to watch Friends Church Easter services. They came to Christ and their lives were changed. And she said, I started to thank the Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, for the generosity and the selfless attitude of Friends Church. And she goes, I can't say thank you enough for all that you have done. I have a wise woman once tell me, God's going to move anyways. I'm just glad I get to be a part of it. Well, I know one thing for sure. I'm so proud, she wrote, to be a part of this church. And I am a child of God. Yes, I am. And others are coming to know Christ because of your generosity. I just want to say thank you. And as you give this weekend, and as you're a part of worshiping God through your generosity, you are changing lives. As we distribute food, as we distribute masks, as we take care of our community and those around the world, you are making a difference. And God is using this church in the life of our community right now in this season. And I just say thank you. And I'm excited to see what God does in us and through us as we move through this season together. As we continue worshiping, would you just bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for stories of, of people because of the generosity of Friends Church that are coming to know you and love you and serve you. Thank you, God, that we get to go outside these walls. People aren't gathering now, but God, your work is going out all over our community and around the world, and we say thanks. God, I am so thankful to be a part of a community of people like this one. So today, as we worship from around the corner and around the world, as we gather as one body and one spirit, may your word speak to us. May you open our hearts and our eyes to see you and only you. And God, the message you have today, may it speak to our hearts, but may it change our lives that we would be different for your glory and your honor. So we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. still waters cover me in mercies speak of all your promise show me that you're near if no one walks beside me you are always with me walk me through the valley resting in
falls, you're watching over me. You will never fail. You will never fail. The God who was, the God who is, will never fail. Everybody, so glad you are joining us today as we are in our series, Unshakable Hope. And I was thinking about it this week. If you're a sports fan like me, I am trying to figure out what all you non-sports fans do with this extra time that I have on my hands because you don't watch sports. Well, I am as desperate to watch any kind of sport that I can. I've been re-watching basketball games and other stuff, but the NFL just had their 2020 draft virtually as they could not have it live where thousands of people gather to celebrate their team's pick. If you know anything about it, they boo the commissioner and they have just another reason to get wasted on a Thursday evening, but it is a spectacle. Here's a picture of last year's NFL draft in Nashville, Tennessee. This year... It was supposed to be in Las Vegas, and they had boats that took the football players across the water at the Venetian Hotel to shake the commissioner's hand. It was going to be just another epic spectacle where NFL teams choose their coveted player and everyone celebrates. But that isn't where it ended up being. Here's a picture of the 2020 draft with the commissioner, Roger Goodell, as he's in his basement. Quite a different picture from Las Vegas to his basement. And all the players were at home with their family and their close friends while the commissioner called out their names and connected virtually with every player. The amazing thing is over 15 million viewers watched this year's draft. That was up 37% over last year, you desperate people. And us sports fans watched this live event because we needed something to cheer about, to get excited about, and to root for our favorite team. And reports kept coming out that the production of this draft, it was actually going to be a failure. And then in the run-throughs, there were so many technical glitches and other problems. They thought that that's going to be the storyline instead of the draft. But the draft was hugely successful. And even though this event had changed locations and no fans were able to gather, and it was virtual, they found a way to make it work. And the dreams of all those players still came true as they were selected to play in the NFL. You see, the most important thing was still the most important thing. And no matter what changed around them, no matter how the draft was presented or executed, those players, those that were selected, still had their dreams come true. Now the rest really is up to them. Whether or not they make the team, whether or not they are successful, really falls on their shoulders. 
Last week in our series, Unshakable Hope, Chris said that, that God had an original plan for mankind, for you and for me. It was really his will for us in this world. And he saw the earth and it was formless and it was empty and, and dark, so God created. Most of you know, in Genesis chapter one, he created light and darkness. He created earth and sea, trees and plants. He created great creatures of the sea and of the land. And then he created male and female and he blessed them. And he told them, be fruitful, multiply, rule over that which I have created. And as I am a God that is for you, I have created all of this for you as well. He saw what he had created and he said, man, this is very good. And then things changed because mankind got involved. Now here's what it says. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in Genesis 2, it details out all the advantages God gave to the man. He gave him a beautiful paradise to live in. He gave him meaningful work to do. He gave him authority over all the animals. And Adam had responsibility even to name the animals. See, God respected him, and Adam respected God. Adam was also given freedom of his will, freedom to do and live as he wished, with just one command from God of what not to do. Here's what it said. The Lord God took the man. He put him in the Garden of Eden to work, and he worked it, and he took care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God also realized after he gave him all of that, that Adam did not have a suitable partner, as scripture says. And so while he was asleep, God fashioned a woman out of the rib of Adam and brought her to him. Both of them were naked. They were unashamed, scripture tells us. And God had created and God had given this garden of Eden, which simply means delight. And all around were the blessings of God, as far as the eye could see. But there was an enemy. And you see, this enemy knew the weakness of mankind and exposed to them the one thing that their eyes couldn't see, which was their heart. See, their heart that was bent towards evil more than good. Their heart that would go after what was pleasing rather than what was satisfying. Even though they could see all the blessings of life around them, their eyes would focus in on the one thing they did not or could not have. And since that one day in the garden, really that battle has raged in every one of us and will tempt us to settle for the temporary instead of the eternal blessings of God. So the enemy comes to Eve and scripture tells us he comes in the form of a serpent. It says that serpent was more crafty than any other animal God had made. And he begins to distort God's word and questions what God had said. Did God really say, Genesis 3, verse 1, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? But he said it to the woman, not to the man. Think about that. Maybe the enemy knew that, that Eve didn't get the message directly from God. See, God spoke directly to Adam, but not to Eve. And it was passed down to her from Adam. Maybe since it was a secondhand message, she would be a little bit easier of a target. So the very first time the enemy takes the stage, he begins to distort God's word and he begins to distort his blessings. He reframes the conversation and focuses on the restraints of God rather than the blessing that God gave to Adam and to Eve. He begins to question God and he causes Eve to do the same. Really? What really did God say to Adam? Here's what he said. You are free. Remember that word, Adam, you are free to eat from what tree? Any tree in the garden. You can eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And the enemy comes along and he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden when he talks to Eve? Think about that. The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it 
or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and knowing evil. So when Adam took Eve on this honeymoon tour of the Garden of Eden, he came to this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said to her, now listen, God said we're not to eat of this tree. And maybe Adam said, I I don't even think we should touch it. But see, she didn't hear that from God and neither did Adam. She probably heard Adam repeat it and add to it. And so Eve adds to what God had originally said. Not only can't you eat of it, you can't even touch it. Well, God didn't say that. But see, Eve added to it. She was adding an extra measure, I think, to protect herself. And I want to let you know, for some of you that have been followers of Jesus for a while, really what that is called is legalism. Extra rules, extra stipulations, extra regulations. And listen, legalism will always lead you to bondage, bitterness, and eventually many turn away from God. You can rule someone to death, but never into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And the definition of legalism is really just to bind you up. And many times we add extra onto God's word because we think that it's protective when really it is restrictive. And well-meaning believers have done this forever. Rules, they've really just created burdens and standards that people can't live up to. And they give up in God many times and they walk away from God. So Eve adds to the words of God. And then the enemy questions the words and the way of God. See, Eve, God is holding something back from you. He's not for you. He's holding something back from you so he can keep a hold of you. If you eat of this, you're actually going to be a God. You will be full of power and knowledge. And Eve, guess what? You're going to be just like him. So Eve has this secondhand knowledge and adds to God's word and the enemy distorts it. And you know what? Same thing happens in our lives. If your knowledge of God is secondhand, if your knowledge of his word only comes from hanging out with us on the weekends, or if your relationship with God is just passed down from your parents and isn't really your faith, if it isn't personal, then you're going to be a lot more vulnerable to temptation than if you sit down and read and study the word of God and invest yourself in a relationship with him to truly understand what is God saying and why is he saying it? And the enemy will come in and confuse you and distort. And just like he did with Eve, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve, if you disobey God, you're going to be more alive. You're going to be smarter and happier and freer than you are now. Well, wait a minute. (laughs) I'm pretty free now, serpent, aren't I? I mean, look around, I got all of this. He said, everything was created for me. It was for my enjoyment and my pleasure without restraint. It's just one tree, just one. And and I have access to thousands of trees. But Eve, just listen up. Unless you eat of that tree, you won't know what it means to live. And I can see Eve in that garden going, "I, I wonder, I wonder what it tastes like. I wonder what will really happen if I eat one lousy piece of fruit. Come on, God. It can't be that bad, can it? And you see, for us today, whatever it is that goes against God's word, it's always that first step that doesn't seem like such a big deal. Until it is. Look back on your life right now. And you got where you are one step at a time. And that is how the enemy works. He loves it when we begin to ignore all of our blessings and we begin to focus on that one thing we can have or that one thing that is happening to us. Chuck Colson said it like this, that the sin in the garden was not just eating a piece of fruit. It was coveting God-like power. We can ignore God's word and look away and think we have it all together and we can do this. We look at the tree or we look at the garden. It just matters on your perspective. What is it that we want? And why is it that what we want is the one thing we don't have? Look, you will have power and you will be like God and your eyes will be open to see good and evil. 
Sounds pretty tempting, huh? Well, it was to Eve, and here's what happened. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them, they were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I started thinking about that passage. You know, um, Adam, he was really the weaker vessel, right? I mean, think about it. Eve was seduced by an evil supernatural being. Adam, he was just overcome by peer pressure and by a convincing, beautiful lady. There's quite a difference there. But the enemy, you see, the enemy wants us to see sin as something good that a bad God doesn't want us to have. And his main lie to us is sin is not bad and God is not good. And just like there was a battle in the middle of the garden between good and evil, there is a battle in the middle of your life going on right now, in the middle of the circumstances that we are facing today. And the question is, are we going to continue to trust God? Or are we going to turn our ear to the whispers of the enemy that feeds us the lies of deception and have us focus on our temporary inconveniences and the chaos that surrounds us instead of the eternal victory that is ours as children of God. Today, I think God's word, and for us as followers, we need to be believers that our victories are gonna be greater than our losses in this season of uncertainty. And that depends a lot on whose voice you are listening to and whose voice you are listening for. See, for me, I started thinking about the middle of the garden. And I started thinking about my week this week as I was just watching TV. And I just wanna admit, um, I was watching the news and I just got frustrated because I had heard so much stuff and so many confusing things and frustration was setting in. And you know what I had to do? I just had to turn it off. (laughs) And I had to make a decision that either I'm gonna trust and believe in God's word and I needed to go to God's word to kind of recenter my heart and to recenter my mind because this negative was just continuing to come my way and frustration was mounting. And I know you've probably been in the same place as many times we hear so many things that come in and we're not sure how to gauge and monitor it all. But see, God spoke to me this week and I pray he's been speaking to you because in the middle of the garden, in the middle of the garden, God spoke. See, remember God had planted the garden in the east of Eden and the tree of good and evil, it was in the middle of the garden. I don't know how far that was from the east, but Adam and Eve had to go on a journey to get to that tree in the middle of the garden. And my guess in their humanity as they might have been seeking out that tree instead of listening and trusting in the voice of God and standing firm right where they were. See, the God of the universe spoke directly to Adam and he chose not to listen. And then Eve gave in and lended an ear to the lying serpent and the blame game began. God comes as he saw that they had ate of the fruit And he asked, what are you doing? And the man said to God, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. And then God asked a question of the woman. He said, the serpent, it was the serpent that deceived me and I ate it. It was his fault. And just like Adam and Eve, our whole nation today has developed this victim mentality. It's never our fault. We blame pretty much everything, whether it's poverty or poor education or job losses or pressures. Maybe it's the federal government or big corporation, our spouses, you name it, we blame it. Everything and everyone except ourselves. And God, if you look at scripture in Genesis 3.13, just simply ask Eve a question. What is this you have done? Think about that. After sin had come into the world, what is this you have done? And Eve blames the enemy for deception And then God speaks to her. He didn't ridicule. He didn't chastise. He didn't blame. He didn't strike them down and kill them in the moment. No, he just asked a question. What is it that you have done? And the first thing he does after Eve blames, he puts the enemy in his rightful place. And he says, listen up, enemy. You will eat dust for the rest of your days. Enemy, you and your ways will not 
win. I love that. He didn't go after Adam and Eve. He went after the enemy and he still does that today. The psalmist said in 108 verse 13, with God, we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. It says this, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He puts the enemy in his rightful place and has been doing that every day since the garden. But I think with the question, God was just looking for the honesty of Eve. Eve, what have you done? And I wonder what would have happened if she'd have just said, you know, God, I messed up. I did what you told me not to do, and I'm sorry. I think God could work with that kind of response. And I think he wants to work with us when we respond and confess to him. First John says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That scripture says your confession equals faithfulness and your God's forgiveness of you and your sin brings purification to your life. And he says, when you sin and you go against my way, he says, just confess and forgiveness is awaiting you. When they did the mock draft for the NFL, as I told you, to test and see if it would actually work. There were a ton of problems. And that's why so many people were saying before the draft that it's going to be a huge failure. And just like many people thought the virtual presentation of the NFL draft would fail, I think the enemy thought it just might be the season. It might be the season that God's church fails and God's people give up on him. And think about it. If you were the enemy, pretty good scheme to get the church not to meet to close down all your buildings, to then cripple the economy and destroy people's lives, to spread fear and deception and cause the world to be in fear full of, instead of full of hope. And I could go on and on, but what the enemy meant for bad, God can and will turn into good and he already has. Here is our temptation, especially in this season. Just like Eve, it's to listen to the voices around us for wisdom instead of listening to the voice of God. I was coming out of my office at home and uh, I walked past this wall of pictures. And we have these pictures uh, that are gonna be on the screen right now. And you can see just our family. It's our Christmas pictures from 2009 all the way up to 2020. And we still have a couple spots there waiting for the next two years of pictures. And as I came out of my office and I was preparing this sermon, I saw those pictures and I was just reminded of God's faithfulness throughout the years for me and my family. And we've had our ups, we've had our downs. We've had, and we're gonna to continue to have trials. But let me just tell you, God has been faithful and he has never failed us, even though we have failed him. Even when we have lost faith, even when we had questioned, even when we have sinned, God has been faithful to us when we have been faithless. I love what 2 Timothy 2.13 says. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Today, I just want to tell you, you can trust God and his promises to you and his promises for you. For no matter how many promises God has made, scripture says, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20. God is faithful to his word and he is faithful to you. In this season, don't give in to the lie. Don't give into that lie of the enemy that your losses are gonna be greater than your victories. The enemy wants you to look around and see all that has maybe been taken from you in this season. And God says, hey, look around at all that I have given you. Our God is faithful and he will see you through. And God is faithful even when we are faithless and he can be trusted. The second thing is this, you can't outsmart the enemy, but you can overcome temptation. Whatever you're facing today, the writer of Hebrews tells us these words. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. So because of that, let us approach the God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, because Jesus is human, he understands. Max Lucado summed up that scripture like this, because Jesus is human, he understands you. 
because Jesus is divine, he can help you. See, don't listen to the lie of the enemy. Don't give up on God and understand you can't outsmart the devil, but you can resist with the help of God and the power of the Spirit, resist temptation. Today, I just wanna ask you, will you take in the promises of God and call out to the God of our promises? See, we sing this song, lots of weekends around here that says, hey, when temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, here's what I'll do, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you are my hope and you're my stay. And then it just simply says, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour, I need you. You're my one defense, you're my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Although everything around us in this season has changed, God hasn't. And today he's inviting you to trust him. Can I just encourage you to look around at all that he has given you and what you were tempted to give up or give in? Remember, he is for you. He is with you. And may you be unshakable in this season because your hope has a name and its name is Jesus. My prayer over you today is this, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for its counsel. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the story of Adam and Eve because there is a story of redemption. God, thank you that as we come to you and as we are tempted, we can call on you. And by the power of your spirit, God, today, may we know that we can overcome. That in this season, for some of us, it's anxiety. For some of us, it's worry. And God, those feelings and those emotions, they're valid. But God, you say, cast everything to you. So today, some of us just need to cast our cares to you. And God, let you take it. Some of us today just need to ask for forgiveness. We need to confess some sins. Whatever that might be, that we confess to you. And God, we thank you that when we confess, you forgive. And that when you forgive, you purify us not by anything that we have done, but by your gift of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. And so today we celebrate that, that in the midst of this season, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of things that, that might seem a little uh, going uh, awry, Father, you were there and you are meeting us and you are working. And so we hold on to those truths and those promises and we say, thank you, God. Thank you that you understand. Thank you that you know, and thank you that you are with us. May our hope rest in you. And may our hope be found in the name of Jesus Christ. And it is in his powerful name we pray all of these things. Amen. There is a song I know it well To bend the deep That's never fair On mountains high And valleys low My soul will rest My confidence in you alone Hope has a name His name Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free, has a name, his name is Jesus, oh Christ be praised, I have victory.
face I'll see my pain no more my fear will cease I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King come on lift your eyes my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King to say thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our friends family this weekend I want to remind you next weekend you do not want to miss invite somebody to, to watch with you and see Pam Tebow hear a little bit about her story and celebrate Mother's Day with us next week all the information you need is at friends.church friends.church love for you to check that out thanks for being a part of our service have a great week